There we go. We are recording now. All right. So uh, under today's agenda, we clicked on the Writing to Learn link. We're looking at the Writing to Learn um, worksheet. It says using graphs for Writing to Learn. Graphs found in textbooks, newspapers, and online can be used to create meaningful opportunities for students to write. By answering a standard set of questions in complete sentences, students are able to show their understanding of graphic of a graphic in paragraph format. Once students become accustomed to the set of questions, they become more adept at formulating their answers and are more likely to be able to transfer the format to other situations. Also, they can take the initial set of sentence templates and then mix, match, and otherwise revise to make more complex, nuanced summaries. So your directions. You're going to study the graph, analyze what is being represented, and you are going to determine what is being studied or what question is being asked and answered. You can do all of that by addressing the following prompts in complete sentences. Feel free to sprinkle in more details from any other research you've done or background info you may have. So there is the graph that you are going to work off of is right here. It is titled Gasoline Prices in 2011. In your very first sentence, you are going to state the title of the graph. In your second sentence, you're going to describe the picture or shape of the graph. So we're talking about the line itself in this line graph. What is happening over time? The third bullet, summarize the information given in the graph. Cite specific statistics and results included in this graph. Name the source of the information. Offer your opinion of the results and then explain how the information relates to you or the world around you. There is a student sample down below to guide your thinking. I would read the student sample to begin with. All right? And then I want you to just take a minute, two minutes, three minutes, and I want you to formulate your own paragraph based on what you are seeing here. Do not push send when you are done, because we have another activity that we're doing with this in a few minutes. Do not copy and paste <laughs> it, but I just want you to look at it. I want you to kind of type up your own sentences, maybe slightly different to what uh, they've already got here. Make it your own. This is more of just practice regarding what you're seeing in this graph right here. What questions do you have? You've had a chance to formulate your own thoughts about what's inside of this gasoline prices since 2011 graph. We're going to read over specifically what the student sample looks like, and then you're going to do the same thing using these bullets for the graph below. And so everyone's going to have something very different for the graph below. And yet, it will probably still be somewhat similar. So the student sample says, this chart published in April 2018 is titled Gasoline Prices Since 2011. That matches the very first bullet that says state title of the graph. They took the title and they reworked it into a sentence. So that kind of, that, in, that is an introduction to the paragraph. The snapshot shows how the gap, how the price of gas has actively decreased. I guess that maybe that says actually decreased overall since 2011. But there are some peaks and valleys in the line. That is going to the second bullet. Describe the picture or shape of the graph. The picture shows a line graph with the prices at the highest in April 2011 and going lower through 2016, 
with a rise again in 2018. So again, this is the third bullet summarizing the information. And what you're going to see here is each bullet is laid out in a new sentence inside of this paragraph. The paragraph continues to say, it makes me wonder what happened in 2014 that caused such a massive dip. To represent the main idea in the chart, there is an icon of the gas pump handle in the upper left corner. The U.S. Energy Information Administration, which I hadn't known about before, is the group that has gathered this data. It is, it is amazing that gas is cheaper now in 2018 than it was in 2011. I think that we may take our cheap gas prices for granted, though I worry a lot about gas prices rising since my parents both commute a long way to work and that could affect our family's money. And I will be driving soon and have to pay for my own gas too. Interestingly, April 23rd of 2018, right here, we are a little over two years beyond that and gas prices are even lower still, aren't they? So you might have even added something like that in the last sentence that you wrote. Gas prices are even cheaper today than what this graph is showing. Okay, so let's scroll down to the next graph. And the next graph is down below. Um, just kind of a brief overview of what that graph has. It's got a number of different states identified on it. I'm going to go over to my computer so I can read it a little better. I'm having a hard time reading it on that screen. Um, down below it says invasive species alert. Zebra, zebra and quagga mussels. Um, there's a link to some information about zebra and quagga mussels. It says habitat. Freshwater lakes, rivers, and reservoirs. Zebra mussels require hard substrates to latch onto, while quagga mussels can attach to hard or soft substrates in water depth up to 130 meters. We have mass on it. This leads to a less restricted range of suitable habitat than for the zebra mussel. Diet. There are filter feeders that consume algae and phytoplankton in the water. Zebra mussels can filter up to one liter of water per day. Range, their, their native range. Zebra mussels are native to freshwater rivers and lakes in Eastern Europe and Western Asia. Quaggas are native to areas in the Ukraine and the Caspian Sea. Local concern, filter feeding removes a substantial amount of food for zooplankton, increases water transparency and leads to an accumulation of pseudofeces. Pseudofeces accumulation creates foul environments. Zebra mussels have been known to colonize on native mussel species in groups of up to 10,000 individuals, rendering the native mussel immobile and unable to survive. There is also an economic cost associated with mussel attachment to pipes and other underwater structures. Means of introduction, ballast water from transoceanic vessels. So we've got a whole bunch of information here. There's a graph that is showing, uh, a line graph that is showing some information pertaining to these muscles and different parts of, I would, I would call this probably the Great Lakes region because we've got Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Indiana, Ohio, New York, and I think that says Illinois. Um, so what we're looking at here is any of the states that are connected to a Great Lake. They have um, shoreline to one of the Great Lakes. So please take um, about 15 minutes now, and I want you to use the writing to learn bullets to formulate a paragraph about this graph itself. You may begin.
I know there are some of you that are still working on this. Um, it looks like I have got most everyone so far. Those of you that are still working, feel free to continue typing. I would like to give any of you an opportunity to read out loud the paragraph that you developed, if you so choose. Is there anybody that would be interested in reading their paragraph out loud to the rest of us? Anybody thinking, maybe I would be interested in reading mine out loud to the rest of us? Is there anybody that would be willing to have me read theirs out loud to the rest of us? Ms. Emily, you're okay with that? Do you want to read or do you want me to? Okay, I will read it. All right, this is what Emily's paragraph related to zebra mussels says. This graph shows the pattern spread of zebra mussels in U.S. inland lakes. The graph shows a steady increase of zebra mussels in the states surrounded by the Great Lakes. The state with the steepest slope is Michigan. This could be because Michigan had access to all of the five Great Lakes. Around 2004, the slope starts to become a lot less steep. While Michigan has well over 250 lakes that are infest, uh, infested. The next highest state is Wisconsin, with around 100 infested lakes. Minnesota shows a great increase in infecting lakes starting in 2008. This information is from Louis E. Escobar. This information relates to my state because I live in Michigan. With the highest number of infested lakes, it is right to assume that we have the most amount of damage from zebra mussels. This can cause ruined underwater lines and, and other underwater structures. This may cause taxpayers to have to pay more one year to fix the lines. This is tough because some people struggle with paying taxes as it is. Snaps for Emily. Woo! Very good. So, is there anybody that would be interested in me reading theirs as well? Very well done, Emily. Um, I like how she went about writing this paragraph that allowed me to understand what was specifically in that graph. It allowed me to, without having to necessarily really look directly at the graph and analyze it myself, I can read that paragraph and get general ideas about it. I also like how she brought up that Michigan has over 250 lakes that are infested. And so it makes me wonder, are the differences that we see in this graph related to the number of inland lakes that Michigan has comparative to other states, are the differences that we see in this graph based on the Great Lakes being in proximity? And maybe human influence, where me as a person, I drive my boat over to Tuna Bay and I decide that I'm going to go walleye fishing. And I don't clean my boat off really well. And then I, I bring my boat back to the lake that maybe I live on, or maybe I just the next couple of days I drive to a different lake and I put it in. And then I'm bringing um, something along the way. Maybe there's some, um, some different type of organic material like weeds or grass from the water that's carrying some eggs of those um, those organisms to the inland lakes and all of a sudden they start growing there as well. I'm also kind of wondering uh, what's the problem with these quagga mussels and zebra mussels because they talked in the in the article or in the information down below about zebra and quagga mussels cleaning the water. So so is clear water clear water a bad thing? So I'm wondering about that as well. So with some information here, we can very easily start to ask lots of questions and explore those questions further as scientists. And that's ultimately our goal, to understand the world around us in a better way through asking questions and observing what's happening. Accepting and rejecting hypotheses. Speaking of accepting and rejecting hypotheses, on today's agenda, you will see that our next activity is a deployment activity called the Game of Science. 
The game of science has some rules. Our goals for the game of science is to use the information that is provided to student groups in order to have you develop a theory regarding the game. You have to determine the rules of the game. So let me pull up that. You guys can go ahead and click on it as well. The rules that's linked on there. So I'm going to click on rules, and it brings up playing the game of science. Directions. Your task is to develop rules to a game you have never played before. You are provided an image of a game board and player move histories. Questions that you need to consider. What, are the, uh, what do the abbreviations mean? How many players? How does play start? How is the game won? How many pieces does each player have? Do the players take turns? Do the pieces belong to individual players? Or are the pieces community pieces? Do all of the pieces move the same way? Or do different pieces have different move patterns? If there are different move patterns, how many are there and what are they? Can the game end in a draw? So you are going to work together in your group to develop a written set of rules. Your rules will be presented to the class and we will be able to compare, contrast, and ask questions. You're going to write out the rules and submit the document to me after you are done. You can write out your rules just as an email. One person from your group can write out the rules as an email, and you can send that to me. Okay? Yes, you want to know how you're going to work in group. We'll find you a spot here in just a minute. I've got to keep you socially distanced, but I also have to keep you near to the group that you're working with. So it might be a little tricky. All right. Uh, online folks, you guys get to collaborate together. You are a team. You are going to use the very first game board. And the very, very first game board is the Gamma game board. So while I was cleaning out my file cabinet, I found some games. I could not find the rules to these games. But I did find a list of players' moves. I need for you to play the game and figure out the rules. Today, a lot of what you do will probably be um, will probably be just kind of disseminating the information, like breaking it apart, taking it apart, trying to understand what happened. When we come back after the break, that is when you will. Um, spend a greater amount of time working on your specific rules. If you find that it's easier to formulate uh, like a shared Google slide or something along those lines, where you guys can kind of collaborate, where you're still working independently at your social distance tables, that is perfectly fine. Um, if you find it easier to just shoot emails back and forth or use a Google Docs or something along those lines, that's fine. But I would like, if you're doing it that way, just share that with me as well, so that I can see your group and what you are working on. Miss Emily, do you get to pick groups? The answer to that is no, not right now. Yes, ma'am. Like to... I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Could we sit in a socially distanced circle and talk about it that way? I think that would be acceptable. We just have to make sure that we are spaced out appropriately in the classroom. Um, I think we're going to refrain from going outdoors to do this right now, just because outdoors has a quite a bit of dew on the ground right now, and I don't think you want to sit in, in water, in wet grass. All right. So uh, online group, I have already assigned you yours. Yours is the Gamma Game. So you guys are going to click on the Gamma Game link.
Ryder, Riley, Jared. You are going to work with the Delta game. Com dead, completely dead. Okay. We'll, we'll figure it out here in a minute. You three ladies right here in the front, you are doing this Psy game. You three ladies right there. How many groups do we have? You are going to do the Gamma game as well. Gentlemen, including Kylan and Jacob and Avery, you're going to do Delta. And then the four of you in the back, the side game as well. So we're not going to do Theta and Beta. We maybe if we get some time later on, we'll try to break those apart. But those ones are those ones are hard ones. You got to be on your A game for figuring those ones out. That one's the hardest. That's the second hardest. The rest are the, the other three are pretty close to the same. So I should have I should have two groups for every one game board. I would like for you to have something available to present your rules to the rest of the class. So then when we do the gamma game, the two different groups are kind of comparing and we can look to see if they came up with the same rules or if their rules are slightly different. <laughs> Questions, comments, or concerns? Yes. Agreed. You don't know what it means to begin with. You are going to decipher what is happening in the game based on the game moves and asking some of those questions that were inside this year document. Is there a way to answer these questions based on the information that is presented? All right. So talk amongst your group, look at the documentation, decipher what you can, 